I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Steve Willis is a personal trainer, author and television personality. Best known as Commando Steve from The Biggest Loser, his real life and views are very different to that which you might imagine from his media persona. So you were listening to the uh, the Charlie Tier episode? I was. Uh, Tell me about the stories that uh, resonated with you that he was talking about. Well, what uh, the question you actually asked him about... um, Regrets, was it? Regrets, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah, and how he said that he'd... uh, in, in all the interviews that he'd done, he can't remember being asked that that right. uh, particular question. So then you could tell just in the pauses and how you you put some fill in there to give him some time to uh, to think of a few things. And um, he came up with that one that he was – you could tell he was quite unsure whether to share or not about um, having a bit of a blue with a bloke. Yeah. And ending up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. – yeah, interesting. I've always admired, you know, his um, his approach. You know what he does, and to be outspoken, you, you need that's pioneers, isn't it? That's people who are willing to kind of shine the light into the dark and say, "Everybody, come on, let's let's go for a journey over here." You know, because without it, we just stay where we are. Well, listen, mate. I am so looking forward to hearing your stories because I adored researching your choices. Are we going to? Oh, really? Oh, uh, yeah. Honestly, I, I, I can't wait to talk to you about these. <laughs> I, I, yeah. All right. Oh, no, seriously. I won't say too much right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your film blew my mind. You Honest? chose. Yeah, I, I, why would I lie, mate? No, it's, no, no, it's no. My, no, my no, podcast. I, I, yeah, I yeah. adored it. So you Wonderful. chose "Walk with Me," the 2017 documentary, and I'm probably going to pronounce this bloke's name wrong, so I do apologise. Tick Nart Han. Very good. Okay, could you tell us about the? Explain for us, if people who haven't uh, seen the film, what it's about, and then tell me why you chose it. Well, essentially, the the film uh, "Walk with Me" by Thich Nhat Han is um, is about embracing a different way of being, and the more gentle, calm, love, compassion, empathy side that I feel we all um, contain, but. Um, we're too busy doing other things. And he, I think the film took quite a while to, um, to film. And um, because it's just, there's so much space, there's so much doing, but not doing. It's, it's, it, for those that, that aren't in that frame of mind and, and, and way of being, it would create a lot of agitation for them because they're waiting for the action to happen. They're waiting for it to the pace to pick up and for it to get faster. But that's the premise of the film: is walk with me, essentially his his walking meditation, and presenting that in a way to the world that um, it's digestible to a degree. And I, I think more and more people are starting to um, to connect with it. Not not just that, but a different way of being. You can call it a spiritual way of being, or um, being more aware of another essence of our being. I feel it's beautifully presented. And um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name. He's, a, he's an actor that's... Oh, um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, he, he narrates it very well. 
He does a great job. Oh. So, so um, when did you come across the Thich Nhat Hanh? Oh, it would have been 2014, right. 2015. And it, um, it wasn't something that uh, just appeared for me. It was through reading other books. And I think it's, that's, that's the way, isn't it? Doors open and you start exploring. And I, through another book that we'll actually talk about in a little bit, um, started to kind of excite me around the philosophy side of things. And I started delving into it and kind of getting into stoicism alike and coming from the military and it kind of, they align, but I felt that it was still a little bit too, maybe hard line. And there was actually a, a, an MMA fighter that had put up a post and I, um, I bought the book and it was uh, Crooked Cucumber by uh, Shunru Suzuki, a Zen Buddhist master. And then the whole Zen Buddhism, Buddhism message really started to land. Well, it, it was, it landed with me much like anything else, but it was the gentleness of it. Yeah. So I, I've done in, in your honor, in preparation for this interview, I've done a lot of research into Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm. What an incredible oh. man. Just, yeah. he's got a sort of a presence. So even watching an interview with him, so I'm looking on a tiny computer screen but I'm feeling calmer and, mm-hmm. in, and, and I'm in the presence of something deep and, and authentic and real. It's just wonderful, man. Um, so I, I, I'm fascinated by the, the incongruity or the tension between sort of Zen Buddhism mm. and being a media personality, for want of a better phrase. Huh. Yeah, you, you know, so, so, so reality yeah. TV shouty bloke yeah. uh, loves, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh. You go, <laughs> uh, I think tell it's me al- about it. It's always been there. Yeah. And if I look back to my younger years, I was very much that all embracing and 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 a very gentle soul. I remember crying at Old Yeller. Remember that film where the the, the poor dog gets rabies and ends up dying, and I was in I was in tears <laughs> as a like a five year old. I, I just couldn't comprehend why this dog that did so many wonderful things for people. Um, ended up dying. I just couldn't comprehend the that connection, and I think it was the whole thing around death, and it, it really rattled me. But my upbringing, um, I feel within myself, I forced that part of me. I, I felt that I needed to suppress that. Um, I needed to put my body armor on and be on guard and be there for myself, and that required me to cultivate a lot more of those stronger, more aggressive um, behaviours and, and I guess, first and foremost, emotions. So, so tell me about the upbringing. Well, I, I grew up um, with a stepdad and he was um, he was a victim of his own suffering. He, he – there was a lot of things that were self-imposed and um, he paid the consequence for them and – he was linging, He was he was living with the hangover of those, and he met my mum when I was about five, and his perspective on life and and how he interpreted it, he it, it it was it was very disciplinarian. He was, I think there was a lot of regret for him, and for me not being his child, um, I, I kind of wore the brunt of of some of that as being the eldest, and then I had three other brothers that that came along but uh being the eldest and quite this meek little soul he probably felt that i needed toughening up but i was also quite hyperactive and just on the go and he will even <laughs> profess that he thought hyperactivity was was a was just it was nonsense and then he met me and he reckons back in the 70s trying to read all these self-help books on hyperactivity and ADHD, which it wasn't too much back then. And, um, yeah, we went, it was loggerheads right. for a period in time. And, and I did, I, I, I guess my dad leaving my, my natural father and, and the like, which I don't remember too much about, but as a young child, when you're only so, shown a certain way, well, you kind of walk that path, don't you? And, and have you met up subsequently with your natural dad or not? Or? No, no, not, um, I haven't been, that compelled, but from time to time, I think about it, and I think that's an age thing and having children, and um, I think I've reconciled 
with a lot of those things. And I think a lot of that has come from reading Thich Nhat Hanh's books, especially one, um, Reconciliation, Healing the Inner Child. Mm. And you're just in, recognizing that I don't need to be so identified and attached to my stepdad's or my natural father's way of being. I can, I can choose my own way and embrace the things that, that enable on a, on a daily sense for me to to experience peace, happiness, and joy. And it's not to say that that it, it's it's still not hard because I think a lot of the time we're going somewhere else at the moment. But peace and or joy and happiness, um, ease kind of goes hand in hand with that. And it doesn't. You know, there can be the joy and the happiness, but it still means you got to you got to toil, you got to work hard, you've got to be diligent. Absolutely. What what one of the other messages of Thich Nhat Hanh is, uh, which I just adore. It's about deep listening, mm. compassionate listening. Wow, how, it's, how it can be a transformative, loving, healing act. So I have to ask you, mate, are you a good listener, do you think? I've definitely gotten a lot better. Right. And, but it's, it, it actually create, can create conflict because when you're willing to listen and listen without giving your opinion or perspective on things, and you might not say anything back, that can rattle people because of learnt behaviour. They're expecting something in return or they might be potentially saying something to, to trigger a certain reaction so it confirms their way of thinking. So it's, it's, it's quite deep, but it's um, when you can listen deeply and compassionately and be open and just take on or, or is it take on yeah take on what other people are saying but not allow it to be or for yourself to wear it so heavy that it actually debilitates you or creates a lot of internal conflict it's um you start to see truths in things you see through the fog i it's, it's wonderful to to listen to to you now i i, I wonder what your thoughts are on if you had this level of awareness and thoughts, uh, I don't know, when you were 18. Oh, yeah. how, how old oh, were you when you joined the army? Yeah, I was 18. Okay, so when you're 17 and a half, mm. you are talking about some Zen Buddhist monk. Yeah, You've imagine. got the awareness. You, you, you're not embarrassed about being the gentle soul. Mm. H- how do you feel your life might have panned out in terms of it could be marriages, oh. could be military, could be whatever? Oh, I, I probably wouldn't have gone to the military. All right. Um. But in saying that, I joined the military to do a trade, which I didn't end up doing. I went into infantry and special forces. But um, I, I feel, in a more personal sense and a relationship sense, I would have, I would have been a l- better at articulating my feelings and emotions and the communication skills. And that, in essence, I think is what relationships are all about. You know, we talk very much about love but it's very much the romantic idea of love but um on an on another level on a much deeper level and if i had been that aware at 17 18 now i'm in my 40s that understanding would be would have just developed even more and but what excites me is even at the age that i started to gain this awareness um and where i'm at with my children and having conversations with them. Like I remember at 40 having a conversation with one of my daughters and she was eight and it just blew me away that um, this little eight-year-old was comprehending. And I think a lot of the time we know when we're younger, but we're just, it, it's not encouraged. So we, sh- we, we tend to shut down or lock away those parts of our being because we're told by society or you know, even parents and the like that, that this is what you need to develop and cultivate. But isn't it a wonderful gift and opportunity to be able to attempt to to be a good parent? I, I love yes. that. That's how the world progresses. You go, yeah. you know, your natural dad, uh, your stepdad, for all their imperfections, they were trying their best and that's, with what they've got. But you can look at that mm. and go, I'll take that and I'll own it. Yep. And then I'll try and build and be the best dad that you can be. And that's just a, you know, what a lovely and journey. That's, and that's exactly, and that's exactly what I've done. And I, I, to this day, don't hold anything against them because they were just doing the best that they could. And, but what also 
brings happiness and, and joy is realizing just how much suffering they were going through and connecting with that and helping to to heal that because I could perpetuate that and pass that on to my children. And then they would either get to a point where their level of awareness goes, well, hang on a second, this just isn't serving me and go about healing it. And um, it, it's it's great. And it's not just within my own family, but I guess in, in being and then conversations like with yourself and others that you can present a different way and um and for those who are willing to investigate and and embrace um it provides an opportunity a a a permission piece uh, would you mind if i read a quote go for it from uh, I, I just it, it it floored me okay <laughs> so this is Thich Nhat Hanh, a 93 year old zen buddhist monk who said he's talking about listening and, and conflict, real yeah. conflict, not just marriage, he's talking mm. about terrorism and all that stuff. And he goes, he was asked how he would deal with it, what would yeah. you would do? And he, and he said, I would say, I would start the conversation by saying, dear friends, dear people, I know that you suffer a lot. I have not understood enough of your difficulties and suffering. It's not my intention to make you suffer more. It's the opposite. So please tell me about your difficulties and suffering. I am eager to learn and understand. Holy crap. If you start a conversation with that premise, whether it be a, mm. you know, your wife, your girlfriend, your brother, whatever else, yep. you're just on the right track. You do, I'm here to understand, to make it better. You go, it, what a presence. I just think amazing. Oh, I, 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 I totally agree. And I, if anyone's interested on YouTube, he, there's a little video that he does on wrong perception and wrong view. Oh, you, did you see it? Yeah. And, and I felt when I was watching that, that this gentleman was talking, but the way in which he was conveying what he was saying, it wasn't just him. It was like the universe had conspired to use him as a conduit to express in words these eternal truths. It, it, I, was, I was blown away. And, um, yeah, I guess you've got, you've, you've got to be willing to... To, to, to walk the path and um, and to do the daily practice yourself, though. So your film was a mm. sensation, oh, but you've you. one-upped it with your book. So we're going from yeah. a man of peace to a man of war, but a, a US Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a self-help book. And, and I'm not big on the hokey-pokey self-help yep. by unqualified, self-appointed experts, but this is Eric Gretton's book in 2015, Resilience. Mm -hmm. I just adore adored every page tell me about that book and why you chose it i've been it had been recommended to me and i was struggling within myself around a few things and uh, what year was this what, what? so it, it was um the year it came out 2015 20, okay 2015 right. and um i guess the common ground was the military and for him having been a navy seal but then learning about him uh, the things that he'd done before being a Navy SEAL and and then how willing he was to um, post the Army or the military, sorry, the Navy to um, to just go about helping others that um, were in need and, and, and willing to, to help themselves and that friend of his that essentially makes the book but also the other work that he's done with um, with veterans and the like. So, so the book is uh, him writing to a former Navy SEAL who was suffering from PDSD yeah. and giving him advice. And the advice, when I was reading the book, I, I wrote down pages of quotes. Yeah. And, I, and it, I've got to ask you a few questions yes. based on these quotes. So, I mean, the, the first thing, which is fantastic, the first step is to take responsibility for who you are yeah. and for your life. And yep. you go, word, mm -hmm. just word up. I love that. But one of the other things he says is, I see every person as superior to me in some way with every person as my teacher. So I, I'm interested to learn is, do you learn things from your clients when you're, get, when you're doing a camp? More, more than anything. People ask me all the time, what are the defining moments? What are the, what are the things that you can put your finger on that have helped to, to shape and form who you are? And there's so many. And the fortune of leaving the military and landing a role on a, an Australian television show, you know, the biggest loser, the Australian version of it, and meeting people where they 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 feel that their lives have utterly fallen apart and they feel that their last bit of hope is to 
to put themselves on a, on a television show and, and turn their lives around in some way, shape or form. And the things that I've, I've learned from them have, have enabled me to sit here today. Right. And um, much to what Eric Greetens, um talks about is, um, is a willingness to, uh, to see yourself as, as an equal amongst everybody and not better than and the like. And, and back to Thich Nhat Hanh, the listening. Yeah. And deep listening. And that helps to, to create connection. And when, when you can connect and unite with people, people are so much more willing to, to give more of themselves. And, and that's what I got from, uh, you know, my time on The Biggest Loser. So another quote from the book is, mastery lives quietly atop a mountain of mistakes. Oh, doesn't it? <laughs> so what have been your biggest mistakes? Oh, oh. My biggest... Have we got time? <laughs> oh, exactly. Uh, yeah, the list, the list goes on. Pick, and it's, pick the biggest two. The biggest two, definitely the first one is, in a, in a much more personal sense, is my intimate relationships. Right. I was just terrible at it. Ex- explain. Just not knowing myself. And... And, and, how, being, and, how and being scared manifest? of myself. How did that manifest how to did, your partners, not knowing yourself? What, what did? Well, going into relationships and maybe not knowing that it wasn't the right relationship at the start and, and listening to my intuition and um, being capable of expressing my feelings and, and my thoughts around things and allowing things to just get to a point where, oh, to a breaking point and... Looking back, you know that's unfair on myself, but it's also unfair on them. And you know, children have have uh, have come about from from those uh, from that relationship and the like. But as much as there's kind of mistakes within that, there's also a lot of learnings. And um, I, I wouldn't want it any any different, essentially, because my my children are beautiful, and they've they've probably been my biggest teacher. Um, second mistake. Oh gosh, second mistake. I can't, I can't, yeah. Because I don't honestly think of the word mistake. Okay, I'm going it's, to... It's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to rephrase the challenge yes, yes. With, with, with another quote. Mm. Accept that you are imperfect and always will be. Your quest is not to perfect yourself, but to better your imperfect self. This book is sensational. What a mm. lovely thought. So, so what are your imperfections now? So not earlier on in your life, yeah. but now today. I'm looking at you. You look... Yep. Happy, you've got a nice presence about you, apart from the pot belly. And this is this is not TV, so people can't see you. I have to tell you, Steve Willis is really out of shape. <laughs> no, but you, you look happy and fit and whatever. That's right. But but what are your imperfections now? I feel like I'd love a lot more, um, be an even better listener, and embrace. Like I still feel a hangover of the past with things where. I'll use the word ego kind of comes in through the back door and 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 taints or uh, wants to take hold in situations that are a little bit tricky and uh, but the cultivation of that awareness or playing that role of the observer I can feel it and it's I don't need you right now and I think a lot of the time that comes from from fear and and not knowing better and um, it can come on really fast. It used to, but nowadays I'm more aware of it and I can just calm it, and that's back to the, the listening side of things. But I, I, I can still be very reactive to, um, to situations, and um, like we all can be. But I think therein lies another opportunity in how you then perceive yourself because when we tend to recognize that we've, really upset a situation or somebody else or the like, we um, we can get angry, further anger with ourselves or we get guilty or the like, and there's not much space or room with those emotions. And they're very debilitating and they wear us out. So when you can kind of calm, when you can get yourself to a place where you can calm those emotions and those, those trains of thought and um, encourage other ones that are, that are more compassionate and the like, you're, uh, you're in a, you're in a, there's a much better footing to move forward. So, so I, I love hearing you. You're, you're, you're on a journey. The last thing I'll say on the book, which, uh, again, I did oodles of research having read it, mm. and I'd never heard of Eric Greetens before. Uh, are you aware of what's happening in his life currently? 
No, so, no. So he was the governor of Missouri. Yes, that's yeah? right. And he had to resign last year. Yes. Because he, he had an affair with his hairstylist. You couldn't make it up. And he was bribing somebody and he was using military charity email databases that he shouldn't be, blah, blah, blah. So a huge scandal. And, you know, the poor bloke, you know, we've all got our dramas. But I'd be interested in your view of of what's your opinion when you discover that a hero of yours or a teacher of yours has clay feet. Just pretend mm. we, we heard that Thich Nhat Hanh, mm. you, you know, was secretly visiting hookers and doing lines of coke. It, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily invalidate some no. of his wonderful messages. but Yeah, exactly. And I think we've all... We've all got, um, you know, our hang-ups. We're all human. No one's, no one's perfect, and um, I guess it's sad, but um, no, it, it is interesting because it, it is all part and parcel of um, of our beings, and I, I, we very much like to highlight and to um, to point the point out the imperfections in people. It's like, oh, I told you so. It's like, oh, you know, this person that, and and I think. Actually, listening to the Charlie Teo interview that um, that you did, back to that that tall poppy syndrome thing, and and he talks about um, being a good surgeon and kind of knowing his stuff in his field, but that doesn't mean that he's a perfect human being and good at every other aspect of what it means to be human. And I think that's you know something yeah. similar with Eric Greetens and the messages that he got across in the book and the other good work that he's done. You know, unfortunately, it's um. It can be. Yeah, it is what it is. Now, your first two choices, I I mean, I'm genuinely grateful to you Mm -hmm. because I really enjoyed watching, reading and researching. Your third choice is where we part company. I knew, because that's why I'm laughing. Found that a Hard. challenge. Yeah, it is screaming vocals. Yeah, pounding guitar. My ears were bleeding, and if it wasn't for this <laughs> podcast, I would have turned it off. So I listened to it yeah. about five times, right. and I hated it more each time. Yeah, uh, I I really liked reading the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I like I liked reading about Parkway Drive, mm-hmm. who did this song that you chose dedicated mm-hmm. in 2015, but I need to hear why you <laughs> chose it. Um I like what those young blokes um are all about. What are they about? And, well, they love their they love the heavy metal, um the way in which the band came about and you know, their their dedication as that song essentially um, speaks to and their time together and they could have just so easily pulled the pin and they went on tours overseas with no bookings. They they played in um, like little venues where there was barely anybody. They would drive, you know, get on the road to the next venue or the next town and sleep on the side of the road you know, in their camper vans, in, in, in their swags and they videoed a lot of it. When um, you know, in their younger years, and they just they they remain committed to their cause and what it was that they were doing. And then over time, people recognised them. And you know, bigger bands in America thought they were great. And you know, they got to a place in that whole heavy metal side of things where they're renowned as one of the best heavy metal bands in the world. And they've they've come from Australian shores um, in uh, Byron Bay. In Byron Bay, so- and and they named the band. After, after, after the, their address, after, after their address, which is, I think, is awesome. But, but it was, it was, the music and and um, doing what they did kind of enabled them to go on this journey, which they they talk about in their their little doco that they did. That's you can watch up on um, on YouTube if you're interested. And what a lot of the time goes with that lifestyle is a lot of drugs and and alcohol and the like, and they don't do it. Okay. And um, they're uh, they're a committed bunch. I've I've met them a couple of times, gone to their concerts, but and 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 I and I love it. But it's not. It's definitely something that I don't uh, listen to as much anymore. Embracing a lot of these other ways of being because you know, it's quite angry, it, isn't it? Well, yeah, and at, and as you said, the lyrics and the messages. You know, even with some of their other songs, are, are very poignant and um, and make you you sit up and uh, and listen and think. 
but um, I think it's just the way in which it's delivered. Uh, but but I, I, there's still a part of me that, as I was saying earlier, that kind of revels in in that um, anarchy kind of sure. like macho you know um, side, and and um, I guess it'll always be there. That's just who I am. But but it's also when I wrote this when I when I was asked the questions and 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 asked to write them down so that you could research them. What I think it also shows is. Um, how we as humans are as much as nature um, a polarity sure. or the polarities and um, embracing that more gentle, kind, calm side of my being and growing that over what I was. And this this is still a part of, you know, the place that I've come from, but it's knowing this, all all this stuff now has only come through knowing, knowing that, knowing the anger, knowing the aggression, knowing what it's like to take it to another level, take it to another, you know, another place. And, um, yeah, it's, and, and those polarities can all, all they do, don't they? They, they, they coexist and, and occur all at once. So I, I have to ask you, cause it, it's fascinated me and the song made me think about it. So it's called dedication. And in terms of getting fit and in shape, you need to mm. be dedicated. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, I've read your website and, you know, read as much about you as I can, it is, I'm conflicted about exercise. And I went to uh, an exercise routine and I went to comedy last week. I love stand-up comedy. Yeah. And one of the lines that it was a female comic said, is brilliant, is every day is gym day right? when you're running away from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And you go, yeah. It's easier to do another 20 stomach crunches than... Be nicer to your mother. It's easier to go oh, on a 10K run yeah. than how, you know, buy your wife some flowers or pick up the laundry. You go, actually, uh, obsessive, single minded dedication can be the refuge of a small mind. If that makes sense. Anyway, so I, I just thought, I, I'm seeing you this week. Yeah. I'm listening to that. I'm hearing dedication. And I thought, I'd just like you to speak to that. Do you think, how do you stop people using it as a crush? Our relationship with things. Well, well yeah, yes. you, you go, I've got lots of problems in my life. So Biggest Loser, for example, I've got yep. lots of problems in my life. One of them, obviously, is I'm 20 stone or whatever. Mm. That's one of your problems. Mm -hmm. It's You'll be a thin, lonely, miserable, self-doubting woman, just not a fat, miserable, lonely, self-doubting woman. It, it isn't, it, it's not a panacea going mm. for lots of runs, if that makes sense. I, I, I... You, and you see it, don't you? And um, you see it with a lot of um, professional athletes, and they pay big bucks to be that person as well. Um, and they, unfortunately, some of them don't have too much else going on in their lives. And and once they're no longer that person, they're so identified with that way of being. You know, who are they? And and we're seeing more and more of that nowadays, and and especially coming out of the military. But um, in my relationship with exercise when I was younger was I, I engaged with it. And you know, to beat myself up because I didn't think too much of myself, but it was also a dear friend, and it was something that I, even through my army career, I did on top of everything that the military expected of me, and that relationship has changed over the years. And my the reasons I engage with exercise now are, 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 are worlds apart from um, when it was or, or how I engage with it in my teens. And for people who engage with it in a way where it's much like any other addiction or, or, or crux as, as such. Um, I guess first it's coming to a realization that you are and it's accepting that fact because with acceptance, you can put some space around it and, um, and maybe get to the heart of your reasons why you're engaging with it in that way. Um, but one thing about exercise I, I, I feel that's different is to do it and continue to do it it requires the resolve. It requires commitment. And at the start, it might be quite superficial, but over time, it, you go at it with, with a deeper understanding and um, it, it, can't, it makes you, uh, well, I guess I can't say it, speak for other people, but in my experience, it's, it's an active meditation. Yeah, and... and I mean, we don't know each other, mm. but but reading about you, I, I, I am fascinated and uh, inspired and moved by by your journey. I, I look at your 
uh, website now and it's all about inclusive and gently mm. encourage. And you go, hold on, I thought he was a bloke with the sunglasses shouting at people, yeah. right? And you go, and you may have been that bloke, uh, but you, you've sort of, you've been on a journey and, and you're still on it where yeah. you are evolving mm-hmm. and it doesn't invalidate who you were because when you're a 19-year-old bloke being asked to go to war or do an assault course, you can't really be yeah. going, um, shanty. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah. Um, there was there was always that intrigue in those younger years, but not having any guidance or people who, in my life, who were thinking or being that way to kind of encourage it, I I, I did I didn't kind of channel it and, and choose to grow it, and it's only as my responsibilities in life grew and I recognised that I was accountable for them and, and especially for children, I, I had to do something about it. I couldn't, I, I just couldn't live with myself being this aggressive, um, hard line father. And you've got to go, you've got to go looking, you've got to go seeking. And, um, you know, thankfully to, you know, some of these wonderful gentlemen and the, the words that uh, they penned in, you know, in their books and doing my own investigation and embodying it. It's not just the comprehension, but it's it's allowing that to filter down from my mind, you know, into my being, into my physical essence, um, and and using exercise as a as a means to do that. That I am where I am. Now we're going to move up the coast from Byron Bay. Yes. To uh, the first headland north of Noosa mm-hmm. in 1770. Dear old Captain Cook sailed past this headland and called it Fiddlehead. I didn't know he that. He did, yeah. And then in Fiddle. his journal, he thought, that's bloody stupid. So he crossed it out. It's still in his original journal, Fiddlehead, with a line through it. And then he wrote Double Island Point. And that is your uh, place in Find mm. My Life. Uh, talk to me about it. No road access, good surf, a lighthouse that's been there since 1884 that's still working. I want to yes. know why you chose it. Uh, it's uh, memories growing up and spending time there with one of my brothers. Drew. Now you've got three. I do. I think just that area, we grew up just north of Brisbane and and then uh, mum and dad decided to move up to a little town called Tyro, which some people may may have heard. It's between Gympie and Maribor. If you drive through it with and blink, you'll miss it. Um, and if you go east from there through the forestry, you pretty much hit um, Rainbow Beach, Inskip Point, and yeah, we get down there as much as we could. And you can go camping on the beach and it, there's just space. It's just quiet. There's no phone reception. You can go surfing. You know, you can go around to one of the other beaches. It's a lot calmer and 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 uh, and quieter for the kids, and and they love it. And you're just out in nature. Your fifth choice. I felt a bit uh, guilty hmm. in uh, asking you to do this because in Zen Buddhism, possessions aren't really the go. Yeah. And going back to Thich Nhat Hanh, he said, "My actions are my only." true belongings. And I thought, oh dear, the poor bloke, he, he can't choose his watch or his pen or his Ferrari. So, <laughs> so what is he going to choose? And yeah. I respect to you, mate, you have broken the genre slightly uh, and you have chosen your health and well-being. Tell me about that. You just see so many people toiling their lives to, to have stuff to only have not looked after themselves and all of that stuff they've worked so hard for is is insignificant and if only they could have a few extra days a few extra weeks you know and the like with their loved ones and um i'm just grateful that it was encouraged in me from a, from a very early age and and i embraced you know physical activity and and well-being as such um because if there was, if 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 you would ask me, if I had oodles of spare time, what would I do? And it would to be, it would be doing something physical, being in nature, being with my loved ones, and just being, experiencing in the in the present moment, and not not having to worry um, about what the future holds, because the present moment is enough. And um, in, I can say that. You know, where I am now, um, based in you know my actions that have led me to this point in my life and the foundation upon which I stand, and 
I know that my health and my well-being will diminish over the years, so I may as well make the most of it now um, because whether we're willing to talk about it or not, you know, I'll use the word death. It's coming for us all. And um, there's another gentleman out there, uh, Ram Das, and he's just released a, a film called Becoming Nobody. And I haven't seen it, uh, but I, I'd really like to get my, uh, my hands on it when I can figure out how you can view it here in Australia. But um, he talks very much to that piece around well-being, and he's been on a spiritual journey for most of his life. And he was, uh, he's an American. He, he was a uh, professor of psychology and kind of went on this spiritual journey. And in his seventies, he had a stroke and he said it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Right. He said, because it, it helped him to realize just how attached and identified he was with his physiology, his, his, his the, the, this, mm. this body we've been given and the stroke left him incapacitated and humbled him even more than he was. And I think all of these things, these messages and listening to those who are at those stages in life um, and are willing to embrace and accept um, those stages and do it with grace because there's so many that aren't. It creates a lot of agitation, a lot of upset. And that's not just for themselves. That flows on and out to their loved ones and the people that are close to them. And it, and it creates a lot of... It, it, Tension. We're going to come full circle mm. and I come back to Thich Nhat Hanh, another quote from him, which really resonated with me. Uh, Keeping your body healthy is an expression of gratitude to the whole cosmos. How beautiful is that? What a bloke. And, and, and I am really grateful to you for coming on and being authentic and open and Thank preparing you. properly for this. Uh, the sixth question is, who do you want to hear on Five of My Life next? Oh, who do I want to hear? Love my life next. Matt Rogers. Wow. I love Matt Rogers. Okay. Uh, why Matt Rogers? I met him on Survivor last year and I've done a little bit of work um, with him you know, over the over the past year on a few other projects. And again, he's just another one of these he's another wonderful human being that um you know, is really willing to lend his hand to those that are less fortunate. And um, he goes above and beyond. He he comes at it from a completely different tack to me, and he actually calls me Scuba Steve. He's <laughs> like, oh, Steve's going deep again. Put the helmet on. He's like, you, you even got the airline in because you're going to need it. <laughs> but um, no, he, he's a great guy, and, and I think hearing his story uh, about coming from team sports and, you know, what that – means to him and you know his father was a legend as well i would love to talk to him i'm a rugby nut and Mm -hmm. he is one of the most naturally gifted footballers i have ever seen on a field steve thank you so much for sharing your choices on five my life thanks nigel the five of my life was presented by me nigel marsh producer alex mitchell sound production and theme music by darcy thompson and matt nicholish 